Okay, good evening, uh, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll make a start. Um, so welcome to this year's fourth and final uh, Barlett School of Planning uh, public lecture. Uh, you've seen me before, my name is Nick Gallant, and I'm a professor here at UCL, and I'll chair uh, the event this evening. So tonight's lecture is um, the finale uh, of our year. It's a special one. Uh, it's our annual Sir Peter Hall lecture, named uh, for our late and very much missed uh, colleague. So Peter's uh, work on cities and regions is known globally and was and continues to be highly influential uh, in the fields of public policy and practice. But at BSP, Peter is very much remembered as a, as a mentor, an inspiration to us, and, and, and very much also as a friend. So we use this occasion every year uh, to remember Peter and his enormous contribution to academic and public debates, and to bring uh, a leading international researcher or practitioner before this audience of colleagues, students, and guests to speak on a topic that resonates uh, with Peter's work. So tonight's lecture uh, comes at the end of a series uh, that's included this year. Uh, Professor Rebecca Chu from the University of Hong Kong uh, presenting on housing for aging populations. Then at the end of November, we had uh, Desiree Fields from the University of California, Berkeley, sharing her research on racialized geographies uh, of housing financialization. Uh, we had a bit of a gap then because one of the speakers uh, couldn't make it and she will be joining us next year. Uh, and then in March, uh, we were joined by Professor Libby Porter from RMIT, who spoke on precarities of dwelling uh, in the settler colonial city. So there are many disadvantages uh, of not being, be, being able to meet in UCL in a lecture theater, one of which is, of course, uh, uh, losing the, uh, the drinks afterwards. But one of the advantages is that it's a lot easier to record these events. So all the lectures that we've had this year are available online for you to look at again, uh, and we'll be recording all future events in this way, and they can be found on our website. Also on our website uh, are details of other BSP events, and we'll shortly be posting the lineup of speakers for the public lectures uh, 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 on the website. So we hope to see you at future events, hopefully uh, back in UCL uh, when that's possible. So let me now introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Anne Forsyth is the Ruth and Frank Stanton Professor of Urban Planning at Harvard Graduate School of Design and Director of the school's Master in Urban Planning program. She works mainly on the social aspects of physical planning and urban development. The driving question behind her research and practice is how to make more sustainable and healthy cities. Her current research focuses on developing healthier places in a suburbanizing world. Uh, with overlapping emphases on aging uh, and planned communities. She's also uh, editor of the journal, uh, the, uh, the Journal of the American Planning Association, JAPA, an author or co-author of several books and many refereed uh, journal articles, chapters, reviews, and editorials uh, that disseminate her, her research in these areas. So building on her long engagement with healthy cities and communities and also with aging, Anne will speak this evening on how COVID-19 might change our thinking on the healthy city and planning's role in attaining it. So there'll of course be an opportunity for questions at the end. You can either type them into the Q&A box and I will ask them, uh, or we can unmute you uh, later on and you can ask Anne uh, directly the questions that you may have. So really without further ado, Anne, thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to UCL and the Bartlett School of Planning uh, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Nick, for the very thoughtful introduction. It's my pleasure to be here honoring the work of Peter Hall. I actually never managed to meet Professor Hall, but he stands out for his work telling the story of planning's key projects and proposing some of his innovations. So today I'm going to reflect on uh, healthy neighborhoods and cities in general and after COVID-19. First, I'm going to talk a bit about how physical places are connected to health using a, a broad definition of health as well-being. 
Then I'm going to dig into some uh, models of healthy neighbourhoods and cities that currently exist uh, based on work that I uh, completed just before the pandemic, but then uh, which I'm currently starting up again. And finally, I'm going to look at what's most likely to happen post-COVID, which is some modest changes. In doing this, I'm drawing on a few bodies of my own work. As Nick said, I'm interested in how to make um, healthy places, both doing my own studies and also synthesizing the work of others. And in a second strand, I've studied new towns and model suburban developments more generally, um, because I've been interested in how people can do more comprehensive forms of innovation. And finally, I'm really interested in developing new methods for planning research and practice. Now, sometimes I see uh, these strands of health, new towns and methods as somewhat separate, but the uh, issue of COVID-19 um, and health brings them all together. It also draws, of course, on uh, my experience or our collective experience of the world um, under COVID-19. This has been a long slog. Um, and one lesson uh, is that what is technically the best thing to do is not always the thing that can be implemented. So many ideas about healthy cities, including a lot of those most supported by evidence are somewhat mundane, just like washing hands for COVID, but it's hard to get people behind the mundane. Um, and so um, in other areas, uh, the science of both COVID and healthy places is contradictory and changing. So it's confusing, which is again, hard to get people to rally around. So while I'll be pointing out what makes a healthy city or a healthy place, I'm going to be really focusing on where you might get political support for making changes. So it's just not enough to be evidence-based. Healthy places also need to capture the imagination. But the problem is some of the things that capture the imagination are not the healthiest. But this uh, brings me to uh, the issue of what is health. Health is actually in one sense technical, but in another sense, a very personal issue. And if I just asked you to define it and you know, talk to someone nearby about uh, what you think it is, as I often do in smaller gatherings, you would come up with dozens of distinct definitions from something like being able to do what you need to do to very detailed visions about what it feels like over time. On the slide is the classic uh, World Health Organization um, definition. Anne, that, um, you haven't yes, shared your slides. You can't see my slides? No, no, I think you need to maybe need to reshare. I'm not sure. Oh, dearie me. Well, let us go back. I thought you were going to I thought you were going to put them up. I thought it was as a general preamble. Sorry, I should have stopped you. No, no, no. Again, uh, healthy places, my outline. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't click the second click. Um, uh, it draws on you. There are three areas, the environments in context, models for healthy places and paths forward. And we're now down to um, what is a healthy place. Thank you for getting me before I went too far. So this is the um, World Health Organization um, definition of health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So public health sees uh, well-being as part of health, but other fields reverse the hierarchy and see health, particularly thinking of it as physical health, as part of well-being, along with things like having good housing or worthwhile jobs or civic engagement. And still others look at a spiritual dimension. So there is a lot of variation in how people think about health and um, how detailed it is, how uh, personal it is and so on. And so for this talk, I'm going to move between talking about health and well-being, using them fairly interchangeably, and trying to be specific about what kind of health I mean when I need to be talking about, say, physical or mental health. So then how are health and place connected? Well, this diagram is a fairly classic social determinants of health perspective that was the basis of my um, 
uh, Creating Healthy Neighbourhoods book. And at the core in the blue is your biology and behaviour. Well, who your parents were, the kinds of activities you do, do you smoke, do you race motorbikes? Uh, here, I have low blood pressure, not because I'm particularly virtuous in my eating or exercise, but because my father did. Your biology does matter. Then at the broadest level in green is this really wider context that uh, provides um, the sort of wider framework for your health. This includes things like the wider ecosystem, uh, media, the economy. And then in the middle are a number of social and economic dimensions of place. And if I had to tell you one thing to do to be healthier, it would be to be educated. But as you can see in the gray, there are a number of um, social networks, um, uh, income and occupation, um, access like to healthcare that matter. And then finally, places have influence in yellow. And they do it in several ways, by protecting you from harmful exposures, by connecting you to the resources you need to be healthy, and by supporting you uh, to do good behavior. Um, but because of all the other factors like biology, the wider context, um, social position, they don't affect everyone in the same way. And that's a key lesson for making healthy places. So this raises the role of the specific um, uh, sort of uh, role environments have in health. And I wanna get at this in several ways. This diagram uh, shows WHO data for one measure of health, that is causes of death, for both uh, the world as a whole and for low income countries. And, you know, these data are always really messy. So um, you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt because they are trying to bring together data from lots of different places. But what you see on the left side is that globally, the non-communicable diseases shown in blue are leading causes of death. And uh, they are even increasing in low-income countries, which you can see on the right. Although in low-income countries, infectious diseases in green have often been key, but as you can see, they're decreasing. I haven't shown the middle and um, uh, high-income countries, but as you can imagine, the blue is really pretty dominant. Interestingly, road injuries show up in uh, low-income countries and are increasing. Um, COVID would, would show up in uh, lower respiratory um, infections. That's the, the part of COVID that's likely to kill you. Now, some of these causes of death have environmental associations, either to do with the built environment or things like pollutants. And it's really hard to figure out what kind, uh, what part of death and disease is caused by environments. But people do it. And here's some example from the work um, of, uh, of a leading team. Um, the big picture here is that different conditions have different amounts of environmental association. And the character of the associations vary. Um, for instance, lots are to do with things like environmental pollution, which might be uh, better controlled by regulations and technologies than say by the built environment. But the built environment and the behaviors related to the built environment have a role, and that includes a pretty big role um, in some of the big killers like uh, stroke and heart disease. Um, so this leads to um, several connections uh, between um, health and place. And in the 2000s and early 2010s, I led teams developing research summaries about these connections. And they broadly fit into three categories of exposures, connections, and supports. And then they differ by populations. And I've highlighted a few topics uh, just to show some of the diversity of this work. So literature on connecting health and place is never really clear, but the literature on air quality is better than most. So with current technologies, for example, you don't want to put a childcare center near a freeway. Although technologies are changing and so this could uh, change over time. How the environment affects social capital 
and con the connections you need to uh, live a healthy life um, is more complex and not least because the literature uh, lacks consistent definitions. For instance, low density in one study might be high density in another. Um, and then studies also look at different kinds of social connections from political activity and action to trust. What it seems, uh, what seems to be happening from the literature, however, is that different kinds of environments um, support different kinds of connections. So there's no clear benefit, say, of a high density or a low density environment. For mental well-being, on the other hand, there are really clear benefits of being able to see green space. But people are really still working to figure out how much green space you need to see. Is it enough to um, have the potted plants you can see behind me or do you have to have more or less? Is a picture enough? And then the issue of population is key. Older people, younger people, people on low incomes and people who have existing conditions experience environments differently. And so a healthy environment that could be exciting and challenging for one group might be fearful or risky for another. And we've seen that in COVID-19 where older people have been uh, really suffered more. So this is exemplified by the issue of uh, mixed use. Um, a few years back, I worked on synthesizing the literature connecting health and place um, at the neighborhood level. And we did a book that came up with a number of um, actions. We organized these around eight principles, five of which were related to the environment and three to the processes and institutions that are important uh, in shaping the environment. Um, and we also had 20 what we call propositions or sort of larger ideas from which we then flowed to action. And here's an example of a proposition about making use the mixed um, use environments. And when we did this proposition, we actually really carefully read the literature to figure out what was really pretty well known and what was uh, possibly uh, um, the case, but, and then what would might be just generally good practice. And there's a clear literature here that everyone knows about mixed use helping walking for transportation amongst able-bodied adults. Uh, although the type of mix matters. As you can see, a garbage dump beside a, a housing complex like the illustration shows is probably not going to increase physical activity, but uh, walking for transportation will um, increase with you know, other kinds of mixed use. There's a lot of transportation and other literature on this. But there isn't as much evidence that it helps other kinds of physical activity or um, even physical activity amongst other groups, particularly the very young and the very old. In terms of social interaction, it may even create tensions and it can increase exposures to some pollutants. Now, I know it's terrible to say mixed use is not all good. And I have been trying to design mixed use environments my entire life, but it's just to say that it requires careful planning and design. It's not just that mixed use is, is a sort of a panacea. So this slide shows a fairly positive example of mixed use in a nicely paved shared street, but it isn't always like this. And so a place like this, although vibrant and convenient for able-bodied adults, uh, could be a place with traffic hazards and trip hazards, uh, particularly for the young and the old. So you really have to think about the differences between different populations. So now you know uh, that there are lots of connections between health and place, but they're not always simple. And that leads me to part two of this talk on models of healthy places, uh, their different types and um, what they might mean for implementing healthier places. If I had to think about the question I get asked most commonly when I um, talk about healthy places, it's for people to give me an example of a healthy place they can copy. And there is actually an industry of healthy places rankings of various sorts. Um, and there's an illustration of one on the left. Um, and they come in kind of two basic types. So on one side are the kind of the rankings that look at where healthy people live. 
The issue there is that it's not clear how much place actually matters or uh, that because where healthy people live may just mean that they happen to live near each other for various reasons. So highly educated people live near each other, for example. Um, other kinds of rankings and ratings look at features thought to be health promoting. And there are a number of those. So they sort of add up places that have good bike paths and um, uh, clean air and so on. I think this small area, um, successful cities, cities for successful aging model is one of those. So what I'm gonna do is look at a, a, a subset of those, which is places uh, deliberately planned and designed um, with a comprehensive uh, set of features that people think will support health. So briefly, when you look around the world at attempts to create healthier cities and neighborhoods, they tend to cluster in a few camps. Uh, one is more comprehensive approaches that combine built environments and collaboration. A second are ones that use a population-based lens, uh, typically using age as, as a characteristic of interest. And these uh, help build allies. And then finally, are those uh, focused on uh, technology, um, both in terms of, um, and healthcare as an industry. Um, and these ones are, actually the ones that maybe popularly are thought of as healthy places, although how healthy they are is a matter of debate. I do want to say this is a fairly narrow set band of healthy cities. These are the sort of exemplars, the best examples. And for much of the world, just getting clean water and sanitation would be a really huge step forward. But these models show how to do something more and have been implemented in a variety of places around the world. So the first group, the classic healthy cities, do two main things. They have healthy built environments that you protect you from exposures, connect you to opportunities and support healthy behaviors. And they use intersectoral collaboration to work across professions, business, government, education and communities. They draw on traditions of healthy planning and public health promotion. There can be narrower versions uh, based on sort of one dimension, like a cycling city, or they can be broader and more comprehensive. Planning has a history of trying to do this kind of thing, as I show with the Radburn plan from the 1920s. They really did reduce traffic accidents when well implemented. And it was often combined with the neighborhood unit idea of the same period that had a theme of social cohesion. So you can see both uh, physical and social dimensions. More recently, um, programs such as the WHO Healthy Cities program that started in the 80s um, have um, come into play. And these programs do a lot of things right. They address chronic diseases as well as infectious ones. They have an equity focus. They're collaborative. Not all involve the community uh, sectors, but most do. The tricky issue is even with these very good programs, their results have often been underwhelming in spite of some exemplars. But with resources, they could provide a local institutional infrastructure to, ma to handle multiple, uh, multiple challenges, including things like pandemics, but much more. An example is Belfast Healthy Cities, which is one of the longest uh, running examples of the long running WHO Healthy Cities program in Europe. It's been around since the 1980s. They've done different things, healthy city plans, health equity assessments, health impact assessments, healthy built environment programs, uh, but mostly they represent a long running institutional collaboration of multiple um, groups around health. A few years back, I looked into studying the outcomes of healthy cities programs and was really surprised at how few survive over time. It was actually really hard to find them outside Europe that had been around for more than a few decades. Many had started in the 80s and faded out or they had not uh, started until later. 
What seems to work about the long running uh, projects is that they have some kind of formal institution, a nonprofit, a collaborative committee in the government that's set up to keep health on the agenda. That has more of a public health response. From the side of the built environment professions, there are a lot of guidelines and toolkits with frankly varying um, evidence bases. Uh, some of them are good, uh, but sometimes they're more about general good practice with uh, cherry picked evidence. One of the better ones is the American Planning Association uh, policy guide on, um, on healthy places or healthy communities. It takes a different tack to the sort of basic sort of build bike paths and we will be healthy approach. Um, much closer to public health, um, talking about engagement, collaboration, health in all policies, and finally design and implementation. So it has a much more comprehensive approach beyond just the built environment, but engaging processes and institutions like the classic healthy cities mode. The second group of models uh, looks at older and younger people and takes their needs as a lens for improving cities and neighborhoods more generally. As I said, helping to gain political traction. These two sound really similar, but have different theoretical underpinnings. Age-friendly communities, which is both an idea and a WHO program, is based on health promotion, like the classic healthy cities I've just been talking about. They're often participatory and look at a range of issues from housing and transportation uh, to social supports and information. Um, New York is one of the larger ones, uh, but this diagram comes from a county in Canada showing one version of the basic uh, dimensions of age friendly communities. But for instance, China is rolling out many thousands in the next five years. Um, and I'm starting to study that program. And then in addition to these more formal age-friendly community programs are other age-friendly approaches beyond the formal programs. So part of the reason China is interested in age-friendly communities is that East and Southeast Asia in the sort of um, kind of darker blue currently house over a third of those over 65 and will continue to do so um, as you can see, and added in, and if you add in Central and Southern Asia, you know, a, a huge part of the world, uh, world's aging population is and will be in Asia. This doesn't show the sheer numbers, but it's also key. Of course, Asia has a lot of the world's population, but it has a lot of the aging population as well. But it's not just the sheer numbers uh, that, that matter, but also the pattern of life. And I've been doing different projects on aging in uh, China and the US. And a key motivation for that um, is the large proportions of older people, particularly women who are living alone and will continue to live alone. These numbers are from the US and you can see, you know, almost half of people in their sort of 80 or half of women in their 80s and 90s are living alone. Uh, in part because they outlive um, spouses. Um, and these numbers from the US are not the highest globally. Now, for some of these folks, this is actually a sign of success. Longevity and better incomes allow people to be independent into older years, and they don't have to ha rely on people in a way that could have been problematic in the past. But that's not the whole story. And these kinds of data can also represent great hardship. Um, it sort of varies by group and place. And so there need to be structures of support services and housing that planning can help with. Uh, an open access article of mine in Urban Design International reviews some of the options. Uh, more briefly, and at the other end of the age range, child-friendly communities come from a different perspective to do with child development and the rights of the child. So they're uh, not coming so much from health, but they do include some place-based activities like park design and safe routes to school as the local area is important for children. 
Again, they can be narrow doing one or two things or much broader, but they like, uh, children like older people can bring together a community to start to think about having a place that's good for health or in for in, when thinking about child-friendly communities, a broader concept of well-being. And finally, our areas focused around the industry and technology of health. Now, I used to think um, that these were sort of fake healthy cities, uh, focused on jobs in healthcare that may not be healthy or an individual monitoring of what might be unhealthy behaviors. But the reason I started to look into them is I had a lot of journalists and members of the public say, oh, it's a place with lots of hospitals, it must be a healthy city. Or look at these gadgets that can monitor everything and maybe diagnose me, isn't this making a healthy environment? Um, and so what I've come to see is that they're quite exciting to many and can be complementary to the more comprehensive approaches. So on one hand would be a city based on healthcare jobs, something like Rochester, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is. On the other hand, are smart health environment ideas that use environmental technologies to make cities healthier. The illustration on the left shows an age sensitive um, crossing where um, it's activated with a transit card and an older person whose um, information is in the transit card can tap on it and go across. But there are other versions where you don't even have to tap it, they just sense your card is nearby. And then there are other developments happening um, that go even further. Again, there can be a narrow, uh, oh, and a lot of them relate to mobility and safety, uh, but some of them uh, do monitoring like air quality and others uh, try to help people inhabit environments, some sort of hearing support technologies and so on. And again, there can be a narrow version that just adds some gadgets, but a broader version would overlay, particularly the smart health environment idea, onto the broader uh, classic healthy cities or onto say an age-friendly community. Um, so for this one, I'll just show um, the smart health environment. This is a 237 hectare smart city outside Tokyo planned for about 26,000 residents and 10,000 workers. It has a high-tech health center, smart watch data visualization and health promotion via activities like exercise programs. And you can see how it would be, could be combined with a classic healthy city to make a more exciting model. And as I say, it demonstrates some of the sort of general technology functions that seem to be, be being put into place at the scale of the home and the neighborhood that kind of measure and monitor the environment or the person. They might do diagnosis and screening um, it, more, that more happens at the home level, but you could imagine people um, sort of uh, fall monitors and so on. And then finally, um, assistance in looking after the environment. So having talked about the range of models uh, somewhat comprehensively, as well as the connections between health and place, um, I want to talk about uh, what's next. So first I wanna give you some caveats. Um, it's not really new to be th thinking about healthier cities. This has been a motivation for planning at, in the sort of its current uh, version for well over a hundred years. And you could say that it's been a motivation for city building for um, a much longer period, perhaps millennia. And there has also been pretty sophisticated thinking about the social and environmental determinants of health in a specifically urban context since at least the 80s. And here you, that sort of went beyond sort of intuitions about light and air um, that spatialized uh, health promotion in a way that it is really recognizable for, in terms of like the best thinking today. And this example is um, a mandala of health uh, by uh, Trevor Hancock and, and colleagues um, that was also republished in the first uh, Healthy Cities paper from 
uh, WHO. And you can see there, it's sort of similar to the diagram I showed earlier, looking at the physical environment, behavior, biology, and then a large number of other factors um, that are involved in uh, promoting health. So, uh, not only institutional ones, but built environment ones, as well as personal and behavioral ones. So it's not like it's a new thing to think about healthy environments. It's also not a new thing to be in a pandemic. COVID-19 is not the first pandemic or the only one currently. Now, of course, we've often, people have been talking about the 1918-1920 um, flu epidemic. This is a diagram from um, a visual capitalist. So I, I disagree with some of it. I, I think it's low on smallpox and whatever. Um, but you can see there have been big Play, a big um, pandemics in the past. But the one I actually want you to focus on is the second from the bottom, HIV AIDS. Um, it's been around for some decades now, but it's also killed over 30 million people. And so, and it's very much still a current uh, pandemic. Um, of course, it's, it's more difficult to transfer, but it shows that not all pandemics are the same. And the next may be quite different, and it could, and, and it could also be um, somewhat bigger. So just to, and also that not all pandemics have built environment responses. So we've got this kind of complex um, context for thinking about healthy places and pandemics. Um, Though fortunately, in a way for us as, as um, built environment people, you know, there's still a, a lot of, well, unfortunately for the world, there's still a lot of chronic and um, non-contagious diseases that the built environment um, can help with. But in any case, I see four options for paths forward. And they come from looking at how hard it is to make changes to create really comprehensive healthy places. So the first path might be that people forget all about the pandemic and we have another roaring 20s, that societies don't really change that much, that people are relieved to be through it. I feel that, that societies will change a bit, but it may not be as much as everyone thinks. Path two is quite likely, and that's pandemic preparedness. Now, many societies will learn to do better public health surveillance, have more robust early warning and have quicker response. In part, the COVID-19 uh, issue has been a failure in quick response. And you can certainly see the difference in the story of the places that have faced SARS and MERS and some of the other flus in the last couple of decades. Uh, places like Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, South Korea and Vietnam. They've done a lot better this time because they had in a way a trial run with those previous um, disease outbreaks. And this kind of preparedness is much more likely to happen in the future. The third path I call sectoral shifts and it adds to the preparedness some bigger institutional responses and modest environmental changes. So, um, I think no matter where you are in the world, I think you've seen some innovations, some spatial innovations under COVID. Uh, many are small and experimental, like helping pedestrians social distance with pop-up shared streets or figuring out how to space people out um, in parks and, and public areas. Some of it has been quite delightful. I had the brass ensemble practicing in the park opposite me for a while because it was the one place they could get together in a socially distanced way. Those kinds of small uh, changes may certainly um, stay. They'd been on the cards before, but uh, COVID-19 has speeded them up. Some are a really big deal like uh, work from home. That's a major change, which may also change. But in terms of health, it's not so clear what the outcomes are. Um, on average, it will help some people and hurt others. So it's not clear that it's a, that it's a benefit for health. And then a lot of the bigger changes that would really, really improve health, like better housing for low-income people, likely won't happen at a big scale. People have been trying to do this for years and it's a really tough nut to crack. And it's likely that it will continue to be so. Path 
four that I can't leave out, but is less likely is an is a move to comprehensive um, healthy communities. Um, People have lived through a long um, period of um, having to think about health. And while there have been a lot of attempts at evidence-based healthy cities and healthy versions of sustainable or resilient cities in the, uh, since the 80s, maybe this is the time it will take off. This collective experience has really changed people. Um, and the illustration is to remind me that uh, places that make this kind of big difference have to do a lot of things at once. This example is from the Netherlands with cycling. Um, and here they not only did the kind of physical changes I'm showing to do with infrastructure and signage and regulation, but they also um, did a lot of education and pricing just through everything at uh, keeping cycling as a major mode. So the, to make big changes uh, would need a big effort. I honestly think that post COVID paths one, two and three are the most likely, but path four may be possible in a few places, particularly if there's been some kind of institution that has been formed around COVID that could continue in the future. So I've uh, now mentioned the many connections between um, health and place. Uh, they range across this wide range of topics to do with exposures, connections and supports. And then I talked about models for healthy places um, and how they have these multiple dimensions, not only around the built environment, but around the processes, the kind of people they reach, the technologies that they might draw on, both new technologies and the existing technology and infrastructure of the city. And then I uh, talked about paths forward. Uh, it's likely um, that places will have better pandemic response, but it's going to be more challenging to have really uh, comprehensive, healthy cities. Um, it's just hard to get people to rally around cooperation and process um, or around really nuanced findings. But here, the smart health environment idea that I have begun to, to work on with colleagues um, from across the campus may be something that can help uh, capture the imagination. And when um, lay it on to a healthy cities approach or perhaps an age-friendly communities approach can really help uh, build alliances and might be a path forward. Something where there's the excitement of technology and the allies of thinking about helping an aging population or perhaps children could be a way to make a difference. Thanks. And thank you very much uh, for that talk. Um, I'm sure there are going to be questions. Could I, could I start the questions off with uh, quite a simple one? Um, one of the things that, that I've noticed and observed in my own research is the sort of flight of people from cities around the world uh, during, ahead of these lockdowns. Uh, we saw it in London, we saw it in New York, um, we saw it uh, in Paris and many other cities across Europe. And a lot of that is to do with the restriction that people are trying to avoid. Um, but I wonder also, and I, I've noticed a tendency that people are worried about going back into central city locations because of transport uh, and the, you know, the risk of, uh, you know, the, the, the continuing risk of the virus and exposure to the virus in work settings and whatever. I just wonder whether this whole experience being so live and so fresh right now uh, is give, gonna give real impetus to, uh, these that's our healthy city agendas. Uh, is there going to be more attention, do you think, uh, in the next few years to making cities healthier, to make it to bringing people back? Or are we going to see, you know, patterns of suburbanization? I mean, some of that will be driven by the housing market, etc. But also for people's perceptions of uh, what healthy environments are. I mean, you suggested tonight that those perceptions are often false. Um, but I just wonder what, how will policymakers respond uh, in the immediate uh, in, in now and, and going forward? Yeah, so what I'd like to say is that there are probably, there's at least say three trends happening in this space that are overlapping, one of which is about health. 
maybe one of which is about the political economy of a place, and then another of which is about kind of personal decisions that people are making and preferences that they have. So in terms of health, just about any environment can be healthy. Um, and so, um, and in uh, core cities, for instance, there may be institutions that can really work together um, to do the kind of programming and policy work that can make a big difference. Somewhere like uh, New York's Aid Friendly Communities is an exemplar of this. You know, in New York, you can put an artist in every senior center. It, that's not quite the program, but it's, it's somewhat similar. Um, and so there's ways that you can draw on that. Although in smaller cities, um, there are uh, many other valuable features. So in a, in a sense with health, um, there are pros and cons of centralization versus decentralization. From a political economy perspective, certainly uh, major uh, core cities will be wanting to keep people there, mm. right? And that's not necessarily a personal preference choice. Um, for instance, governments seem to be sort of forcing their employees to go back into core city, you know, government offices so that they can restart the economy. That has very little to do with either personal preference or health, um, but it's to do with, um, you know, that that different um, municipalities or governmental entities want to keep their economy going. So there's going to be a bunch of economic pressures. And then there's going to be a set of pressures from um, individuals um, that are trying to, who are trying to make decisions. And some individuals have found that they do not need to have the same locational choices as they needed to before the pandemic, in part because of the increase in technology. And this has um, some pros and cons for health. So I've actually been working a bit in Australia on a project that was looking at decentralizing to regions. And we started way before COVID. And Australia has uh, pushed a lot of development into Sydney and Melbourne in order to have global cities. And so the government periodically looks to see whether decentralizing would be um, viable. The issue with pushing people into the major cities is that they become very expensive. And so housing in Australia is quite expensive. Um, and um, so the opportunity that you have um, post COVID is it's really shown that it's possible for people to live in regional centers um, and be able to continue the economy. And it is, it's not just knowledge workers because as knowledge workers move to those centers, so do the restaurant workers and so on. So there's a way of filtering so that people can have um, other locational choices. There's something similar in the US. There's a lot of small cities that really have very inexpensive um, kind of housing, really need population and where um, there could be some decentralization. So that is sort of a political economy meets personal preferences issue. And I think that's actually quite hopeful because it means people could spend less money on housing and more money on other things. Uh, but you do have to then worry about the core cities. You know, as a suburbia expert, I think moving to small cities or suburbs is not a bad thing and making them better is great and deconcentrating some of the super expensive cities might not be bad either. But if you own real estate in those locations or if you're a government who relies on the tax base, you probably don't agree with me. No. I hope that was not too comprehensive. But from a health perspective, no. suburbanization, decentralization is fine, um, as long as it's done in a kind of equitable way. And that's probably easier to do that in uh, smaller cities with um, less expensive housing markets. Great, thanks, Anne. Uh, I'm getting a few questions in now. Um, just to remind people, please put the questions in the Q&A so we can go through them systematically. So Rose Adams asks, COVID-19 has shown how important open public green spaces are for people's physical health, but most significantly for people's mental health and well-being. How would you go about incorporating more green space in high density cities or high density areas within cities, such as the City of London, with such restricted space? This is a fantastic question. And I think it's not just public space, but also private space. Um, Politico had this, uh, which is a political uh, magazine, 
had a, a sort of a series of articles uh, last year on like changes after COVID. And I picked, they asked me and I pitched a few ideas to them. And the one that they liked was private space. I actually think the balcony is way underappreciated or the small patio. Where do you hang out your washing, right? That's the, where do you grow a tomato plant or um, just be able to feel fresh air? So um, I'm not talking everyone has to have a huge moat of lawn. I'm saying private space is actually quite important too, as well as public space. And um, it's and and having been a housing uh, expert in a in an earlier life, things like balconies are the first things that go from um, affordable housing, for instance, or public housing. Like you, that's that's the first cut, so that uh, lower income people really have less access to all of this. So um, I think it's a matter that that the actual amount of green you need is not huge, um, and so there uh, so. Think potted plants for mental well-being, and you're on a reasonable um, sort of track. But then I think it's just a matter of finding spaces where you can. And one of the nicer things that's happened under COVID is all these kind of shared streets and street takeover kind of ideas, uh, where it's it's become clear that not all street, every street needs to be a through street, and you can close them off for um, at different times of the day days of the week or even most of the time. And so I think it's a matter of finding spaces where you can. Although in some ways a little deconcentration would matter. Okay, great, thanks. That was a great answer. Um, you mentioned tomatoes. So I have a food question from Richard Wakeford. Um, Richard says, I knew Gus Schumacher who focused on bringing real food to poorer neighborhoods. After all, it's what we eat uh, has much to do with longevity and personal fitness, e.g. Uh, um, avoiding diabetes. How significant a factor could farm fresh food be in making a difference? Is it measurable? Oh, this is where this, uh, everyone is so excited about local food. And I'd like to say that the science is more about um, Fresh food is important, right? And um, how local it needs to be is more, in my opinion, an issue of um, how you count climate change than actually thinking about the nutrition. So where it comes from is, I think, more environmental issue than a health issue. Um, and sometimes getting it from further is actually environmentally more benign uh, because um, growing in some locations is difficult. But definitely having fresh food is important. But if you want to, uh, there are, you know, there's been a lot of work on physical access to fresh food and, and so on, and that is um, important. But if you were to do one thing to make people eat healthier food, I would give them more money. It's because pe uh, lower income people are making very rational decisions to get the maximum calories for the minimum cost. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's to do, and some very uh, calorie dense foods are actually quite tasty when you're used to them, right? It's, it's hard to give up. Like I could never convince my mother to give up biscuits. So, um, so I do think that part of the issue is a, is a cost issue um, rather than so much a physical access issue. And nutrition wise, uh, farm fresh, but whether that farm has to be five kilometers away or could be a bit further is um, a question that I think is more about environment than about health. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, I have another question from uh, Nicholas Falk who asks, will health be a stronger force for developing sustainable cities than carbon emissions? If so, how can land for housing be mobilized around transport nodes to avoid the tendency for everyone to drive, creating a health hazard for others? That's a very interesting question. 
The issue here is I think technologies are changing. So um, the kind of emission hazards we have now may not be the emission hazards that are occurring in 15 or 20 years. Now, an electric vehicle is not an emission-free item. The stuff that comes off the tires and all that kind of stuff. I am a car-free woman, right? And I have actually not driven a car for maybe two years at this stage. Although I've got one to go to the, to the um, plant um, nursery in next week. But um, so I am not a, like a pro-car person. I'm a, I'm a cyclist. On the other hand, I do think that um, the emissions argument is not necessarily an argument. It's a, it's a moving target what emissions you're getting from transportation. Um, I think probably a stronger argument for denser and, and mixed use areas would be the physical activity argument and maybe the social connection argument, as long as you're not so dense that you start irritating each other. So there's a kind of a, a sort of a lovely balance that you can get with enough intensity to be able to access places, not so intense that you irritate people and also not so convenient that you get the elevator, you're in a high rise, you get the elevator down to the noodle store, buy the noodles and then go up and never get any physical activity. There are sort of levels of mixed use that are counter to health. So I feel that Health can, health can get everyone on board. And it's part of the reason I got interested in because I thought that environment, people you know, were not as into environment. But having looked at health, people see it so personally, it's not always as good a, a um, unifying force as I'd imagine. So I just feel that there's probably, so that's a complicated way of saying, emissions may be a moving target. There are reasons, health reasons, to have particular environments, but you have to talk about a lot of different things. And then I'm not sure health is always going to be a sale, uh, a way to sell particular kinds of environments. For some people, the um, carbon emissions will be more important. Great, thanks. Uh, I've got a question from Lisa Long, who sort of takes us in the direction of health inequalities. Uh, faced by different groups in the city. And she asks, do you believe policymakers will be able to uh, reduce health inequalities amongst ethnic groups and how? Yes, but it's not always going to be built environment um, kind of factors, right? So what are the, the issues that different ethnic minority groups have? Well, it's actually different with the different groups, but some of it is um, an income issue, right? So ac accessing healthy food and being able to have decent housing. Some of it is a cultural issue, being able to be healthy in a culturally appropriate way. Uh, this may be food or physical activity or a number of other, or, or having appropriate healthcare providers. Some, so that's income culture. Some of it's locational. If people are in a particular place where they don't have access to, um, health um, facilities or there's air quality problems. So um, those are all things that you can change. The one thing that will be in common is that it's important to have some collaboration with the community to obtain local knowledge, but also to exchange knowledge. So I think it's Jason Corbin has a nice example in one of his books of people who were um, a, a fishing in New York, and the, they thought and it was a, a and it was a cultural practice, but the fish were um, contaminated. So they thought it was fine to eat the fish, but it actually wasn't. So it's important. The one thing in common amongst all those sort of economic, spatial, uh, cultural issues is to have a process where you're interacting with folks, finding what they believe. They have some knowledge that uh, experts don't have about what's good practice, where are healthy places, but sometimes they are not informed about the potential dangers. And so there's a way that experts can let them know. So I think definitely can be done, but it's, it's a sort of at, the, at a fundamental level of process issue and a collaboration issue rather than necessarily a built environment kind of issue. Great, thanks. 
I've got a couple of questions now which sort of touch on uh, smart cities. Uh, the first one is from Caitlin uh, Rollins Rollison, who asks, well, she says, firstly, thanks for a great presentation. And her question is, I would like to ask if you feel there is a tension between some of the larger examples of smart health projects and developing more sustainable cities which are healthier for the planet. For example, with projects like uh, Kashiwa in Japan, it seems like a very resource intensive new build project without obvious consideration for sustainability. So is there a tension there? Yeah, no, this is a really interesting project. And after I got started working on this, um, I uh, joined a project that's um, just get, get, getting going here under um, anthropologist Arthur Kleinman, but also including people from engineering, public health, the business school, and so on. And we're actually looking at what we call social technologies for aging. And the big idea, and it comes out of anthropology and social medicine, is to try and think, are there ways that technology can be harnessed for social purposes and particularly for those of low incomes. So are there ways that you can use technologies um, to make them less expensive, either by reducing the cost of the technology or by making them more robust so that they can be shared or, uh, making, or thinking of uh, sort of new things that can help people along. There's a lot of really fantastic technologies. My area I've been looking at in particular is the ones that work the neighborhood scale, although many of them are about um, helping people become more mobile and so on. So the issue we've been grappling with there is how do you make it less expensive? Which technologies are the ones that you should focus on? How do you make it culturally appropriate? So having a bunch of anthropologists on the team, they were doing a lot of in-depth interviewing and they're going to do observations and so on to really start to understand um, people's uh, sort of fundamental needs. So that's to say that I think that there's at this, I think a lot of the, the smart environment places have been kind of marketing strategies and that they have been expensive and problematic. But I do think we're getting to a stage where some of the technologies are very um, helpful. And um, as there are more older people and fewer um, younger people to care for them, having some technological assist can be useful. Um, and so that's the technology and social aspects. The environmental aspect of new build versus others is actually a lot of uh, what they're talking about could be retrofitted. I just think that the, the property developers and, and others have been more inclined to put them in new build uh, environments because they can use it to market it. But I don't think it's essential about new build, that there are ways as gadgets get smaller, um, there's also sort of a whole sort of software level of, uh, of these new technologies and environments. I think there are some opportunities and I'm, I used to be a total cynic and I've become uh, much more open to thinking that it's a positive, um, that there's potential in this. I hope that was clear enough. Yeah, great, thanks. The other smart um, question uh, concerns healthcare work. And the question is, how will bringing in smart technologies for healthcare work uh, work in undeveloped countries where there's too much poverty? I, I think this question really uh, is about uh, smart technologies for diagnosis. Uh, that's how I read it. Uh, and clearly, you know, there is a, a broader issue about cost and accessibility of some of these things that could... Uh, uh, potentially improve people's health. Yeah, so this is actually quite um, interesting. Like certainly there are technological divides and there's a great number of difficulties um, in doing this. But in the idea of telehealth, um, one of our Chinese collaborators in this project is um, at Tsinghua, is um, interested in palliative care and um, there are no palliative care kind of specialists in rural China. And if you think about it, but many people have smartphones or there is some way to get access to a video screen. So um, in that way, it could be that people in rural areas finally have access to real specialist care um, in, um, in subjects that really the specialists either it's just not viable to be in very small rural areas 
or um, it's just there are just so few specialists. And when I think about how smartphones have sort of rolled out through Africa and they're used so much in people's businesses and so on, um, and people have businesses, you know, doing phone calls and so on, I'm a little more hopeful that it might be possible to, uh, particularly in this diagnosis and screening, um, to roll out some uh, technologies and that telehealth could be quite uh, positive. Great, thanks. I've got a few um, questions that really focus on London. Um, so you, you need to know what's happening in London to, to answer them. But I'll try and generalize one of them. And this is from anonymous attendee. An anonymous attendee asks, do you feel there is a tension to build homes at scale? I think they mean homes at speed quickly to tackle the sort of global affordability crisis that we see in many major cities. And, uh, it, it, and a tension between that, that priority, and actually delivering uh, uh, healthy uh, communities and healthy environments. I think probably just, just I would just add on that question that in, in the UK at the moment, uh, there are various moves afoot by government to reform the way that we, the way in which we plan development uh, and to uh, release non-residential buildings for conversion uh, to residential use. And there are a lot of concerns in the UK I think about the, 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 the sort of environments that are created by these deregulations. So is there that tension? I mean, do you see it in the US as well between you know, trying to do things quickly to solve a housing crisis, but actually missing the target in terms of delivering for uh, urban health? Yeah, I actually don't think there's a fundamental tension, but I think there's often a practical tension uh, that you know, you need to pay attention to a few sort of variables when you're doing a housing development, and you may well decide not to pay attention to um, healthy aspects. But really, um, it, it actually is not super difficult to do both. Um, but I do know that many governments just want to approve whatever it is, no design review, no guidelines, nothing. That certainly makes it harder to do lots of things and also means that down the road you might have um, housing that is less um, resilient to many kinds of crises, environmental health and so on. Well, I, th I think you and you'd be very interested about, uh, to hear what's going on uh, in the UK. Um, I won't de detail it now, but um, we have this whole debate about the conversion of uh, for, uh, of commercial buildings to residential use. And one of the big issues of that, of course, is how convertible they are in terms of the quality of space that can be created, but also the location of those buildings. They were, they were built with, a, with another use in mind. Yeah. Some of them may locate next to, you know, busy roads or, you know, railway junctions and what have you. And the environment for people may not be, is not a residential environment. So that's the concern. Or if you're going to put people in there, put rich people in there because they can afford a lot of like gadgets and gizmos to kind of filter the air and get rid of the noise and all that kind that's of thing. A, that's a very good idea. We'll, we'll suggest that. Okay, <laughs> so um, I'll just move on to another question from uh, Borgia Ruiz. Uh, oh, great, that's a good question, sorry. Yes, yeah. Thanks for the great presentation and for making it available to all. If I understand, Correctly, Professor Forsyth mentioned that sustainable neighborhoods or suburban life is not necessarily unhealthy. I guess this is based on the health and well being of the suburbanites. But if we address health from a global perspective, could it be that those not necessarily unhealthy environments and those suburbanite lifestyles would be causing less healthy environments elsewhere? Greetings from Spain. Well, oh, thank you very much. This is, I, I, I love this kind of thing. Um, suburbia is not all McMansions in, you know, on acre lots. Uh, suburbia is very varied. There are inner city suburbs and industrial suburbs, and there are suburbs that are old towns, and there are um, suburbs at varying densities. Um, there are like high rise suburbs, if you think about what would be suburban Hong Kong in the new towns, it's uh, quite different to say a, a suburb that used to be a village somewhere that's sort of grown up and so on. I, I wrote an article a while back 
um, on sort of nine definitions of the suburb, uh, talking about how kind of varied they are. Um, in the US, more poor people live in suburbs, small people live in suburbs in general, but poor people have been growing. Um, if you want to have, um, if, if you want, honestly, when I go to the Paris suburbs, they're so much more diverse than the central city Paris, which is like full of tourists. So um, suburbs are like super varied and they vary in terms of their environmental impact. They are not all necessarily automobile based and they do have a bit more land sometimes to be able to, to retrofit and um, provide, uh, you know, sort of clustered environments, mixed use environments, you know, a bunch of parking lots are really land banks. So just to look at more positively, there's a lot of different kinds of suburbs. And so I think they can be healthy for lots of different kinds of people and they can be less expensive than a core city. So if you're kind of stuck having to pay enormous amounts of money to live in a, a core city or could have, you know, a little more space or a lower cost house in the in the suburbs and have more money to spend on healthy food there's something positive about that so my main um uh, sort of point is that suburbs are very varied and so of course some of them are wasteful and problematic for the planet but many of them um have really strong potential to be great healthy places to live that are both and they have enough density to be interesting, um, but not so much uh, price pressure as to be unaffordable. There's a, there's a lot of potential in suburbs. I am a, a sort of, there are of course many dull, mundane, energy um, intensive suburbs, but they're not all like that. So the main thing is to think about environments for themselves and not sort of just make a unique city suburb split, although I did it earlier, so it's my own fault. Great. Thanks, thanks. I've got a question from Daniel Fitzpatrick, uh, which, which relates to the community's role in, uh, in delivering uh, uh, healthy uh, cities and neighbourhoods. What sort of planning tools can we use to develop for more community-led understandings of healthy cities and neighbourhoods? You mentioned health impact assessments, and they could be carried out by community groups, for example. Yeah, so the, there's a several levels at which you can come up with a community led understanding. Um, at the largest level is something that's more of an institutional framework. Um, so a working group or a long term um, sort of a trust or a nonprofit, depending on what country you're in, um, that really focuses on health. So the Belfast Healthy Cities has had this into a collaborative kind of um, kind of working group for a long time. I'm not sure how much direct community they have, but they've certainly had people who represented the social sector and so on, and they've then done participation. So then the second level, after you have some kind of institutional collaboration, which may be more toward between organizations and actual sort of specific individual community members, would be to work at the sort of the project level. And that's things like, health impact assessments. There can be very technical health impact assessments and sort of rather short term checklist type health impact assessments. But um, there are a number of models that are about uh, workshops and sort of ongoing participation in thinking about health. And then apart from health impact assessments, there's a lot of other tools to get community input, uh, surveys, uh, workshops, um, Audit, participatory auditing and so on. Just about anything you can do in participation, you can do um, in health. So definitely, um, but at these two levels, there are opportunities to get community input and it's quite important uh, really. And if you think about something like, I don't know if you, uh, you must have something like councils of the aging or aging kind of committees in councils or whatever. You yeah. could see that kind of group as being a group that could be, the core of an age-friendly community, for instance. So there's often a sort of nascent um, institutional structure for which you could add a few more people or organizations and really have an ongoing inst institutional structure that can then do a lot of these participation techniques. Right. So there's lots of opportunities. I'm gonna hit you just with another couple of questions and then we'll let you go. Um, so, 
Uh, I've got a question from uh, Yuji Zhang, who's a uh, first year student of ours, currently undertaking research on neurodiversities and the built environment. Oh. And they ask, since the mental health problem, or since mental health problems are rapidly becoming more significant in modern cities, I wonder how uh, uh, could uh, their work, you know, the work that they're doing, maybe how it should be directed to focus on uh, the, the mental health or, you know, or non-health of minorities and how, uh, how, might they, uh, how might that issue be reflected uh, in the broader construction of healthy cities? So how might mental health be brought into this? Yeah, you know, that's very important, and it comes through in a variety of dimensions. So there's this sort of general health and well, actually, when when we talk about health and well-being, there's three or four ways of thinking about it. There is sort of general uh, mental well-being, um, whether you uh, you know you're depressed or lonely or whatever. Then there is sort of cognitive functioning, which is not really mental health, right? But it's like how well you process and learn. And so on. it's related to mental processes, not mental health. Then there is this issue of stress, which is actually physical. It's not mental, but it's often put into the mental health and well-being kind of um, bucket. And actually, uh, green helps you with stress. And then finally, are the people who have some kind of... Um, sort of difference in terms of their mental functioning. It could be um, to do uh, with uh, the neurodiversity that you're talking about. Um, there's also you know, cognitive issues to do with aging or just different ways of perceiving the environment, um, you know, whether you are able to sort of navigate the environment as well. That's a common problem people have. They're not as good at, some people are better than others at navigation. So definitely when you think about the built environment, there are ways in which you can help people. And it's classically around things like um, nature and access to nature for some of the mental well-being issues. Um, and it's also to do with things like wayfinding and having a clear kind of mental structure for some of the other issues. There are things beyond the built environment something like being able to have very stable employment and a sense of place and so on can help you as well. Um, and those, uh, you know, having a sort of a strong social network and things. So it's not all, always the built environment, but they're uh, planning related um, other issues. So I definitely think this is an important topic uh, that could be dealt with more. It tends to be dealt with very specifically. So some people look at people with cognitive impairments or other people who may have wayfinding problems or other people who may have um, stress. I, I do think it could be brought together more coherently. Great, thank you. Um, Sonia Frere Trigo asks, well, first of all, she says, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, you've been talking uh, tonight about the long history uh, of, of planning healthy cities and you've drawn out some current models, um, including smart technology related models. How useful do you think these models are when tackling health in cities with large informal settlements? How can we plan for healthy, set, healthy environments in those places? Yeah, so um, uh, not so much the smart cities, but the... Um other approaches have been used in places with large informal settlements. Sometimes it's been used to improve the built environment, for instance, like adding playgrounds or, um, you know, clean, uh, some of it's been infrastructure, clean water, um, sort of more access, physical access to healthcare and so on. Um, and some of it has been about uh, social organizations, uh, having people do things collectively and so on. Um, that, and also just classic public health, things like vaccination campaigns and so on. So you have seen um, like classic healthy cities uh, rolled out in a variety of places. They just emphasize the issues for the people at that time, which may or may not be as planning related as um, others. So in some places, the planning stuff is really key and it may be very important to like 
build more streets and paths or playgrounds or whatever. In other places, it may be a vaccination campaign or social organizing that's more important. And that is one of the nice things about the classic healthy cities approach. It'll meet people where they are. Great. Thank you. I'm just uh, looking through the questions. I, I did promise you that that would be the end, uh, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to hit you just with one additional question, and that's from uh, Harry Birchall, which I think probably relates to uh, the community uh, point about the community involvement. And Harry asks, at what scale do you think uh, we should be dealing with uh, a healthy place and uh, and health health strategies? Um, is it right to deal with things in a very uh, sort of uh, regional sort of way or are our matters best dealt with uh, on the ground at a community level, maybe by communities? I think it kind of depends on the process. So thinking about the example you gave about um, affordable housing in London, that's something where actually a regional approach might be quite beneficial. Uh, to think through uh, good locations for affordable housing. If they have sites that are not appropriate locations, what else could be done with them? That's actually hard to deal with at the local level where you've got this one site and you have to decide yes or no. You can't see the big picture. The food system happens at a very large scale and it's important to sort of think about uh, it at a regional level. The transportation system is at a large scale and it's important to think about it at that level. So I do think that like planning occurs at multiple levels, it's in general, healthy planning needs to. And you know, some parts of healthy planning might be at the policy level, at the national level, and then others might be regional and then others might be local. Um, the, and, you know, just like other forms of planning, it can be hard to um, involve, get people excited about something that's 30 years out. That's one of the dilemmas of transportation planning, for instance, hard to get people excited about the long term future. So, again, you need to have kind of different kinds of methods for involving people. And sometimes you're going to involve people who are sort of representative rather than like every single person who's affected by something um, so that you can make it manageable. Okay, I, I promised you that would be the end. I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase the last question now. Um, and that is basically that, um, you know, cities, there's a, there's a great discourse about cities having been uh, for a very long time planned by men. Um, and possibly that, that mode of planning has resulted in exclusions in particular a neglect of gender, which I suppose could have gendered um, uh, health impacts as well. Um, I think you're looking at the question uh, from uh, Christy Tong. Um, how would you how would you respond to that uh, sort of um, point? Well, I think Christy's question is really about the last part of it. She says, "On this matter, is it really possible to create inclusive, healthy environments in such a short time span, such as now and through the pandemic?" And this is actually quite an interesting question because in the pandemic, there've been a lot of short term changes that have been made. Things like uh, shared streets and more cycling and so on. And how much it's really gonna change uh, people's fundamental behavior patterns is still an open question. I just wanna say that it's, it's important to start somewhere and also to get feedback. Um, I also think sometimes, I, as a person who started cycling in kind of middle age, um, I, and uh, as, a, as a female and like has dealt with all that stuff, um, there's something to be said for getting going. And so um, in some ways, the sort of shock to the system um, has been useful and might have um, shown some paths forward. So I suppose in summary, what I would say is the shock to the system is not always bad. Now the time, and, and it can start people in new behaviors. Now there's the time to reflect and think what's worth keeping, what might need to be pushed for, further, and what we might wanna just change because it was a short-term solution that was not so good and we need to move backwards. And there's a gender dimension uh, to all of that. And thank you very much for that uh, answer. I think that's a perfect point to end on, actually. My, my wife is sitting next to me, whom you've met a few years ago, telling me, ask no more questions, ask no more questions. So I think uh, we have reached a, a logical conclusion. 
thank you so much for your uh, talk this evening. Um, there are words of thanks coming in, and I'm sure that were you in London this evening, you would be hearing, you know, applause from everybody, and we'd be sharing a drink at the end of this. So thank you very much for, for doing this online lecture this evening. Uh, You'll owe me something when I next come to London. We absolutely do. We, we in the after times. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'll Bye. say goodbye to you now as well, because once uh, we close this, um, we all sort of disappear and go our merry ways. So thank you very much uh, again. Um, and my wife says hello. Thank you, Anne. It was really nice, nice to see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. So Great. good night, everybody. Thank you to everybody listening tonight as well uh, for your contributions and your questions. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer them all. I'm sorry if I butchered some of them as well. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure you'll agree. It's been a fantastic talk this evening uh, and so relevant to uh, everything that we're experiencing at the moment. So thank you very much, Anne. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.